And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Every word is important here. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us, in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen? God, what an amazing portion of scripture and no human mind could have ever assembled these thoughts or these words. Certainly no human being could have ever accomplished what you accomplished. And, and Father, we pray that you would unfold your word to us tonight and that you would cause us individually and corporately to see exactly what you want us to see. And God, that there would be I suppose that the simplest prayer tonight is that there would be a greater appreciation and gratitude for all that you've done, that we would never forget, God, we would never forget where you've pulled us from, what you've pulled us out of, and what you have drawn us to. God, we're grateful tonight. Your, your sons and daughters are thankful. God, we love you. Thank you for loving the unlovable. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat tonight. Um, you know, from time to time, I think it's um, interesting to read rags to riches stories. And, um, you know, I mean, they're just, sometimes they, you know, incite a little bit of hope. Um, but I was reading one recently about Larry Ellison. And uh, this guy was born on the lower east side of New York during World War II. Um, when this district was filled with immigrants who were struggling just to survive a a very poor childhood. At an early age, he was diagnosed with severe pneumonia, um, was sent to the south side of Chicago where he lived with relatives. And as he grew up, he joined a software company called Software Development Laboratories, which changed its name in 1982 to Oracle. And Ellison, who was you know, raised in total abject poverty, ultimately became the CEO of Oracle and accumulated over $46.2 billion in net worth. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Rag, rags to riches. And, you know, sometimes these stories are presented like, man, this is the American dream. This could be, this could be you. This could be you sometime. And I want to say to you tonight that if you're a Christian, it is you. It is you. You are a rags to riches story. And, you know, this, I think, is what I struggle with sometimes when people reduce Christianity to just going to church or when people reduce Christianity to, you know, um, religious ideas or religious principles or religious philosophy. Really, people miss the point because the truth is this. We have gone from being lost sinners to trophies of God's grace. That's the story of Christianity. You could, you could put it like this. We have gone from rags of sin to the riches of God's grace. Um, and I think that maybe more than any other portion of Scripture, um, these 10 verses really unfold what God has done in every one of our lives. And, you know, wherever you come from, whatever your background is, you know, I, I know sometimes there's the tendency to, um, for us to 
categorize some testimonies as uh, more powerful, you know, more powerful than, than other testimonies. And, you know, that's a, that's a human convention. Every testimony is powerful. Like, who, are, who really are we to put testimonies in different categories as some, you know, being more powerful than others? The truth is, we were all in the same boat, we all had the same situation that we were dealing with, regardless of what the circumstances looked like or regardless of what the details were, we were all absolutely, totally, and completely lost sinners, <clears throat> right? <laughs> I mean, if you, don't, if you don't agree with that, raise your hand tonight. I just, I'm curious. And God in his grace, God in his grace pulled us all out of that pit and made us trophies of his grace. And if you agree with that, say amen tonight. Okay, just checking. And I think these 10 verses, look, uh, these 10 verses really unfold the reality of that, the drama of that. And there's such a, a strong contrast. You know, as you work through verses 1 to 3, you see just how lost we all were. And I'm just going to tell you on the front side, this is not going to like, this is not going to make your flesh feel good. Um, which is, you know, really not my job in the first place, nor is it the job of the Word of God. Um, but it's not going to make your flesh feel good. Like, you, you, you know, you read the first three verses, and you do sincerely come to the conclusion, if you're being honest with yourself, that Paul came to when he said, that there is, that is in my flesh, nothing good that dwells. There is no good thing that dwells in my flesh. And you conclude that from these three verses. And, you know, if it wasn't for the, the starting phrase of verse 4, but God, I mean, the whole book would be, uh, you know, a tragedy. It would be a misery. But thankfully, God intervened in the midst of our miserable situation, and God did something about it. Amen? Amen. So, so let's work through these verses uh, one word at a time. And. And is a conjunct. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this is going to be a long night. All right, the Bible says, And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So when Paul is speaking of the you, you're going to see from the context here, he's not just dealing with these individuals who were in Ephesus. By the way, Ephesus was similar to Las, Las Vegas, you know, culturally. It was, um, it was a city that was steeped in idolatry. The worship of Diana um, was not only prevalent in Ephesus, but they had exported the worship of this false goddess to the whole known world. And so, you know, it was a, a city that was known for uh, idolatry. It was a city that was known for sexual excesses. And these people who had um, been saved were saved out of that in a similar way as we've been saved out of the madness of our own city and so in a, in a qualitative, all-encompassing way, he says, you, he made alive. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You know, what can, what can a dead person do? And by the way, is he speaking of physical death here? He's speaking of spiritual death. You know, I think it's important to, re to remind all of us tonight that, that we are born spiritually dead. When Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happened was exactly what God said would happen. In the day that you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. And certainly, years down the road, Adam did experience physical death. But it wasn't just physical death that God was speaking of. It was spiritual death. There was a breaking in the relationship between humanity and God. There was a spiritual death that came as a consequence to sin. And so every person that was born from that point on was born spiritually dead, maybe physically alive, maybe emotionally, intellectually alive, but spiritually dead. And we'll get to this point in just a minute. Um, this is why we have to be born again. This is why Jesus said, unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because we're born spiritually dead. A spiritual dead person can do absolutely nothing. A spiritual dead, spiritually dead person can't work hard enough to earn the favor of God. And the spiritual death was not only a consequence of the nature inherited from Adam, 
but it was also a consequence of personal actions. So before you look to Adam and just blame him for everything, the Bible here says that you were dead, Paul speaking to the Ephesians, the word of God speaking to us, you were dead in trespasses and sins. The word trespass means to step over a moral line that God has clearly drawn, that we are fully aware of. In other words, there are things that we have done in our life that transgress a known moral command of God. Whether we've been exposed to the Ten Commandments or whether it's just the law of God that's been written upon our hearts, all of us have done things that, that we knew and that we know are things that God did not want us to do. So there, there are actions of volition that we know are wrong in the eyes of God, but it's not just trespass, it's also sin. This means, by nature, we fall short of God's mark of perfection. Um, the Greek word is hamartia. The old English word means uh, to miss the mark. So in olden days, in, uh, in, in the homeland, as it were, when uh, archers were practicing, they'd pull the bow back, they would shoot the arrow, and if the arrow did not hit the target, if it fell short, it was called a sin. And so when the Bible speaks of our sin, it means that we have fallen short of God's mark of perfection. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are none who are righteous, no, not one. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, that as we consider the law, we are all confined under sin. In other words, there is no one who's perfect. There is no one who's hit God's mark of perfection, his divine expectation. And you say, who is God to have a divine expectation? And I say, well, he's God. That's why he can have a divine expectation. But the reality of sin in our life simply compels us to cry out for a mediator like Job cried out for a daysman, one who would stand between him and God. And so Paul is, Paul is expressing the reality of how far um, we naturally are from God. So number one, he says, you are dead um, in those things that were a clear violation of God's will and just by nature falling short of God's mark of perfection. Verse two, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Paul says, there was a point in time in your life where your life was led and directed by the ways of the world, the philosophy of the world, the direction that the world was leading you in. You know, I don't want to get ahead, but you know, you, when you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, have you ever felt like this? Have you ever felt like a salmon swimming upstream? Have you ever felt the complication of being, being a Christian in the culture that we live in? Why is that the case? Because the world has a course. The world has a direction that is leading people in, and it's all pointing in a direction. Let me tell you that direction leads away from God, not to God. So repentance means to make a 180-degree turn from the course of the world to the course of God. But this is what Paul is saying. This was how you lived your life. You were moving in that direction according, it gets worse, according to the prince of the power of the air. So let me ask you a question tonight. Who is the prince of the power of the air? The devil is the prince of the power of the air. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, John says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. You say, well, I wasn't that bad, pastor. Well, the Bible here says that you lived your life according to the prince of the power of the air. You know, this is one of the one of my favorite verses in the scripture is in Colossians chapter 1, where the Bible says that we've been conveyed out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son, who is the object of the Father's love. And I love that verse because, because it relates to us just how far God has moved us. God has moved us out of the kingdom of darkness. God has moved us out from underneath the dominion of the devil. Amen. Right? God has secured us to himself, and he's rescued us, and he's delivered us to his kingdom. But there was a point in time in our life, regardless of what we may think or how bad we think maybe we weren't, where we were living under the prince of the power of the air. He says, um, let me just read the whole thing again, in which you once walked according to the course 
of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So Paul is continuing to build this case Um, the situation that we're all in. You know, I think there was a point in time in my life for sure where where I would have fully rejected this, where I would have said, hey man, maybe that's true for some people, but that's that's not true for me. You know, our flesh fights against this because naturally we want to be able to say that in us there dwells some good thing. We want to be able to say, we want to be able to, to, to acknowledge, you know, we think wrongfully, but we think that we can merit God's favor through our good works, that we are essentially good people. You know, we build a positive case for humanity and we think, well, you know, we're really not that far gone. And huma- humanity, every generation is getting just a little bit better and a little bit better and, and we're progressing and we're moving forward and and, and I'm saying, you know, like you probably should stop s- smoking the pot because that's, that's clearly not true. I mean, you look around and the world is a total mess. I mean, you can't make a case for the goodness of humanity. There's just not the empirical evidence that's there. And, you know, before you, before you take the next step and say, well, that's them and this is me, the Bible says that we all once conducted ourselves like this. We all once were living after our own flesh. There was within us these desires, whether it was in the physical body or in the mind, that we wanted to satisfy, which is why Paul said in Romans chapter 6 that at one point in time in our life, we were slaves to unrighteousness. There wasn't even the power in our lives to choose those things that pleased God because we were spiritually dead. Now, look, this should, this should be compelling you to think, man, there really, truly is no hope apart from God for us. He goes on to say, look, he just punctuates this point by saying, we were by nature children of wrath just as the others. So what Paul is saying here is considering not only the nature that we've been born with, but considering our own behavior, our own desires, the course in which we were living our life, our rebellion and rejection against God, stepping over lines that God had clearly drawn in the sand, by nature falling short of um, his mark of perfection, we are, in fact, children. We were, in fact, he's speaking in the past tense, we were, in fact, individuals who deserve the wrath of God. We were individuals who deserve the justice of God because of the sins that we have committed against him. And, you know, this, apart from like verse 4 all the way to verse 10, like if this chapter ended here, this would be really bad news. You know, and, the, and, and um, you know, I would say for sure that the only reason there is good news is because of that small phrase, but God you know, I don't, I don't mean to be crass tonight, but I'm grateful for the butts in the Bible. You know what I'm talking about? It's a disassociative conjunction, you know, where, where Paul is building a case as bad and as dark and as miserable as that is. Paul is saying, on the other hand, nevertheless, let me say to you, there's good news. There's hope. There's hope because God intervened, because God stepped in. You know, there's no Tower of Babel that can be built that will enable us to ascend to God, to have a relationship with God that's made by us. There's no system of religion. There's no personal morality. You can't just put your kids into Christian school and expect that because you've done that, that somehow now God's happy with you. It's not about how many times you roll into church or how many messages you watch online or how much you pray or how many rosaries you do, or how much money you give. None of those will ever deal with the reality that at the very core of your being, what needs to happen is for you to be forgiven of your sins. In fact, the Bible says that apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of our righteousnesses before God are as filthy rags. They're nothing to him. They're worse than nothing. They're all a demonstration of our own pride. This is really rough. This is really rough because I want you to think about this. You know, you think maybe you're here tonight and you're like, I'm a good person, you know, and God, 
God will receive me because, you know, for the most part, like when all the math is done, I'm in the black. You know, I'm not in the red. I, I don't beat my wife. I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't kick my dog. And that's got to count for something. And I would say, listen, the, the, the deeper issue with that is now you've committed the sin of pride because you think on your own somehow you can merit God's favor or on your own you've hit that mark of perfection or on your own your good works somehow are outweighing your sins against a holy and a righteous God. Look, tonight if you're not a Christian and all of this is making you feel uncomfortable, I would say that's good. That's good. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. I remember, you know, for me personally, like I spent a lot of time giving Christians a hard time. I hated the message of Christianity. And, you know, even if a Christian wasn't talking about sin, their very existence reminded me that I was on the wrong track, which is why I think I gave Christians such a hard time. Because whenever they were present, it was a reminder to me that I was not right with God. And I wanted to continue in the lifestyle that I was living without having to have that reminder. The bummer for me was at college, my, my, my roommate was a Christian, so I couldn't escape it. It was constant. He'd put scriptures on the door. He'd read his Bible before he would go to bed. You know, he'd invite me to church. He'd put posters up on our wall that had scriptures on them. I mean, and I, I gave this guy a hard time and I blasphemed God, not because he was wrong, but because I was wrong. And I knew, I knew in my heart that I was wrong. God had to bring me to a place where he humbled me, where I had to hit rock bottom, where I was confronted with my own issue. And I had to acknowledge that the issue wasn't with God. It wasn't with the culture. It wasn't with what others had done to me in my life. The issue was with me. And the issue wouldn't get fixed until I owned my sin. You know, that may seem like a really hard step to take, but it's the best step you can ever take in your life. Just to own it and to bring it to God, to take responsibility because it's in the place of repentance that healing and grace and mercy comes. The great story tonight in Verse 4 is this, God intervened, God acted in the gospel, in the fullness of time. Who is this that the God, um, who is this that the, that the Bible speaks of when it's speaking of God? Well, it says that God is rich in mercy. God is rich in, have you ever known a rich person before? They like never run out of money. God, God's like a rich person in this, he never runs out of mercy. He never runs out of mercy. The Bible says that God's mercies are higher than the heavens above, that they are brand new every single morning. God takes great pleasure in not giving you what you deserve. That's what mercy is. God does not give you what you deserve. You come to God and you're repentant and you look to Jesus Christ and God does not give you. The only way to escape punishment and justice is to look to Jesus and God stands ready to extend his mercy to you. Why is he merciful? The Bible says in verse 4, because of his great love with which he loved us. Why is it that God has a vast resource of mercies that are available for you? By the way, just curious tonight, how many of you really need the mercies of God? Raise your hand. I'm just, I'm just curious. You know, you know why he extends his mercies to you? Because he loves you because he loves you. Man, that's, that's just a good message, and I know we hear it all the time, but, but I can, can I just say it again? God loves you tonight. God loves you. Are you receiving that on a, a daily basis? You know, you, you get all, it's good, and it's not just that he loves you. The Bible says because of his great love. You know, don't you think that Paul um, found himself limited by the Greek vocabulary? You know, Paul doesn't know how to qualify this in an even greater sense because he can't. All he can say is, man, the love of God towards you is great. And it's not in the abstract. The Bible says, with which he loved us. He loved us in the concrete realm. It's not that he just said it. It's not that he just wrote it in the heavens. But he, he, he acted. He did something. He expressed his love in the giving of his son. You know, if... 
if you're looking for love in the world, I, whenever I say it like this, I, I think of an old song, looking for love in all the wrong places, and I have no idea why. <laughs> God help me. I'm still being sanctified. But you know, sometimes I think even as Christians, you know, we look to the world, we look to people to give to us what only God can give to us. You know, there's a need that we all have within our lives to be accepted and to be loved. And the truth is, you know, you get battered and you get beat up in this world because people's love is fickle. Sometimes people, they love you as long as you're doing what they want you to do or you're giving them what they want you to give to them. You know, the, the world the world will use you up and throw you away, but God will never do that. God's love will never fail you. God's love is more steady and sure than the rising of the sun in the east and its setting in the west. God's love is the one thing in your life that you can stand on and trust in. It is the resource, listen, it is the resource that will fuel you. It's the resource that will strengthen you. In your times of weakness, in your times of despondency, in your times of confusion, in your times of doubt, in your times of faithlessness, what you need to look to and stand on is the love of God because God will never stop loving you. And that is what brings you strength and that's what brings you hope. It's the one thing that you can hold on to in this life the character of God. And you say tonight, well, how do I know that God loved me? Because He gave his son for you, with which he loved us. For goodness sakes, what is Paul talking about here? He's talking about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the greatest display of love the world has ever seen. You know, the world talks about love as if it knows everything about love. And the opposite is true. The one who really knows everything about love is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the love of God, the love of the triune God was demonstrated when the Son was incarnate. When the Son humbled himself, even though he was equal with God and in the form of God, he came in the likeness of man, took on the form of a bondservant, and humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. When the Bible speaks of love, it looks to the gospel. How is this that God has done such a great work in your life? It all comes through the power of Jesus Christ and what he did for you and what he did for me. And the message, you know, this is what's in Paul's mind. He's talking about this great great distance that you have traveled from being dead in your trespasses to becoming a child of God, which is why he says in verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. So Paul says, God didn't just love you when you started doing good things for him. God loved you when you were dead. God loved you when you couldn't do anything. God loved you when, when your life was deeply in the red. God loved you when you were in the midst of rebellion and rejection. God loved you when you were speaking things that were, that were like blasphemy to him. While you were in that spot, the love of the Father was upon you. The Bible says in the book of Romans that it says this in Romans 5, 7. Let me get this whole, uh, these two verses together. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. So Paul's just saying, hey, listen, you know, I mean, you know the way that we are. Maybe someone would give their life for someone they thought was worthy of it. Possibly, maybe on the, on the, uh, on the outlier someone who was a righteous individual. Maybe in that case, someone would say, well, you know what? They're such a good person. They're so righteous. I would even give my life for them. And then verse eight, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the contrast is this, that, you know, with the mind of the world, someone might say, well, if uh, if it was a really good person, maybe someone would give their life. But, but God demonstrated his love towards us. We're not really good people. We're not really righteous people. We've done nothing to earn his favor. In fact, this verse says that while we were in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our falling short, in the midst of our failing his expectation, in the midst of trespass and doing those things that were an offense to him, 
God allowed his son to die for us. This is the great love of God, and this is the contrast that the Apostle Paul is talking about, even when we were dead in trespasses. That's how sure you can be of the love of God for you. Verse 6, so what did he do? You are deep down in this pit of sin, and verse 6 says, and he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So you have gone from the rags of sin to the riches of God's grace. You have gone from dwelling in the house of the devil to dwelling in the house of God. You have gone from, you know, this putrid life of God rejection and trespass to being raised up in the heavenly places and and literally being positioned so that you can sit with Christ Jesus. You can be a co-heir. You have a new standing. You're a citizen of, God, of, of heaven. You're a child of God. You're a servant of God. You're an ambassador of the gospel. Look, the same power that raised Jesus up from the dead and has seated him at the right hand of God the Father, Paul said, is the same power that works in you. And your destiny in heaven is settled. God has made you alive. You know, this was the discussion that Jesus had with Nicodemus. You know, Nicodemus was the teacher of Israel. And, and he came and he said, hey, you know, uh, Rabbi, we know that no one can do the works that you do unless God is with them. And, you know, you just love how Jesus kind of cuts him off at the pass. And he says, hey, Nick, most assuredly I say to you, that's, there's the equation, verily, verily, most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus, a teacher of Israel, is like, man, his mind is all spun out. How can one enter into his mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus says, man, the words I speak to you are spiritual. In other words, you can see the, the result of the Spirit when the Spirit of God is moving on someone's life. We're talking about spiritual renewal. We're talking about spiritual rebirth. A spiritual rebirth happens when you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. There is a renewing that happens in your life. You begin to, to, to long for and to hunger for the things of God. You remember when that change happened in your life? I don't mean to talk about my testimony a lot tonight, but, but you know the very things I used to make fun of Christians for? Lame music, lame little gatherings, lame book, lame dress, clothing, lame way of speaking, all of a sudden when I put my faith in Christ, it's not like someone kid came to me and said, now you have to do these six things. All of a sudden, I'm like, I love that book. I love the book. Like, I love the book. I don't even know why I love the book. I can't stop reading the book. You know, I mean, the book that I thought was just so bad and so lame and so restrictive. You know, a book that I thought was full of, you can't do this. And all of a sudden, I find out it's full of, look what God has done for me. I can't put the book down. I don't want to go to class. I want to go to Bible study. You know, I start listening to music, and, and we're worshiping. We're worshiping in, in the congregation of God's people with a bunch of people I thought were weirdos and psychos and crazy and, you know, just wackos. And all of a sudden, I'm a wacko. I'm a crazy. I'm singing at the top of my lungs, you know. It's not even a concert. It's just worship. It's just worship. Because when we worship, we're not just singing songs, we're singing to Him. We're expressing our adoration, we're expressing our love, we're expressing our gratitude. And when He pulled me from the pit that I was living in, when He pulled me out from living under the prince of the power of the air, I had a lot to thank God for. I had a lot to thank God for. You got a lot to thank God for tonight? You know, it, it is interesting to me, sometimes as Christians, you, you know, we can, we can go from like really intense gratitude to really intense complaining quickly. You know, we're at one point in time, we're like fully cognizant and aware of how bad it was, how bad off we were, how hopeless we were, and then we get a little Christianity under our belts and all of a sudden we become these sophisticated religious people, you know, really unthankful for what God does pinpointing problems in other people's lives, setting ourselves up as the standard, not being ambassadors of grace anymore. And I think, man, God, keep me from that place. 
Keep me close to you. Keep me humble. Keep me thankful. Keep me filled with gratitude. I don't want to be a petrified wineskin. I don't want to start thinking that somehow all of this that, that you've done, now really somehow I think I've done it, or it's my work, or it's my willpower, or it's my calling, or it's my, my gifting. You know that apart from Jesus Christ, we are as lost as a rock. Like we are living in total hopelessness apart from Jesus Christ. And so I would suggest to you tonight that our gratitude shouldn't have just been really great and zealous when we got saved. Our gratitude should grow. <laughs> because as we grow in our relationship with God, we come to the same conclusion that Paul came to when he said, I'm the chief of all sinners. It's not that Paul was lukewarm or backsliding when he said that. It was that Paul had his spirituality deepened, and day by day he recognized just how great the work of God was in his life. And so he has raised us up. By the way, I love the, the corporate sense here, you know. It's not just you as an individual. He has caused us to sit together. You know, the beauty of the corporate body of Christ sitting in the heavenly places. And the purpose of all of this is that in the ages to come, we would be trophies of his grace. People would be able to see the exceeding riches of God's grace in our life. You know, grace I've said it so many times, you know, and I know that you know what grace is. It's God's unmerited favor to the infinitely ill-deserving. It means that God gives us what we don't deserve. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, all the things that we have as a gift from God is a result of his grace. It's a result of his kindness. You know, I think sometimes the word kindness we don't necessarily use it in relationship to God's disposition towards us, but God is kind towards you. God is kind towards you. Through Jesus Christ, God has demonstrated his great kindness. Religion comes down to what you do for God. Relationship comes down to what God has done for you. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So verse 8, he kind of, I, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he drills down on this, this word grace here. For by grace, how have you been saved? For by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I, by the way, I love these two verses. I love them. Because they really um, communicate to us the, the essence of salvation. And I think it's important, you know, like we've uh, maybe at this point in beating a dead horse a little bit, but I think it's important for us um, just to be reminded that it isn't our works. It's not the gospel and the things that we do. It's not, like I said, being on the role of a church or our church attendance. And under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, you know, Paul, um, Paul expands this idea of grace and the simplicity of receiving the grace of God by faith, our salvation, being saved from our sin, being saved from death, being saved from hell is all a function of the simplicity of trusting in Jesus Christ. Somebody should be thankful for the simplicity of the gospel tonight. I mean, it is good news. It's good news because Jesus Christ did the work for you on the cross. And all that you have to do is receive it. That's why it's called, that's why it's called a gift. How many of you are looking forward to getting Christmas gifts? Raise your hand. Oh, the rest of you are liars. <laughs> You're liars. I love, I love the difference between the way women open gifts and, and guys open gifts. You know, like in our house, uh, we'll get Rachel a gift, and she's like, oh, look, the package is so beautiful. And she'll pull the bow apart, and, you know, she'll take a long time doing it. I'm like, babe, just open the gift. But she'll pull the bow, she'll take the bow apart, she'll set it aside, because she inevitably will use the bow next year. She'll carefully pull the, the package, the, the wrapping on the package apart, you know, and lay it flat and refold it maybe sometimes. Then she'll look at the box and, you know, she'll, she'll carefully open the box 
Um, if it's a card, she will open the envelope and um, she'll open the card. She'll set the gift card aside and she'll read the inside. And I'll just say, guys are so different. You know, I'm like, I don't care about the bow. I don't care about the wrapping. Like that stuff comes off faster than you can possibly imagine. And the box is ripped open, thrown aside, and, you know, the gift is in my hand. And, you know, honestly, honestly, like if it's a card that I get, you know, the envelope is open, the, the card is open, and the, the first thing I look at is, is it Home Depot? Is it Starbucks? Is it, like, I'll get to the reading part, but, but, I, but, because the words are nice, but the Starbucks card is the gift that keeps giving, so... But, but, but look, however you open it, the point is to receive it. However you open it, the point is to receive it. However it looks with the wrapping, the point is to take it. Um, and that's what God extends to us. God extends salvation as a gift because he loves us. There's a gift. If you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, there's a gift for you at the tree, at the cross, where Christ hung for you, paid the price for your sins, was dead and buried, and the Father acknowledged the sufficiency of the sacrifice by powerfully resurrecting Jesus Christ from the dead, who then ascended to the right hand of God as a forerunner, as the one who goes before you, securing for you the idea that as he has gone to the Father, when you put your trust and faith in him, you will go to the Father as well. And Paul says, it's not of works, lest anyone should boast, because that's the temptation of our pride. And finally, in verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So verse 4, God intervened. Verse 5, God did the work. Verse 8 to 9, God reveals the method, grace through the gospel. And verse 10, we are trophies of God's grace. We are his workmanship. Um, the Greek word is, of course, most of you know this, some of you do, poema, where we get our English word poem from. It means to be God's masterpiece. It means to be um, God's orchestration. It means to be God's work of art. That's what you are. You are God's work of art. You're his masterpiece. As you put your trust and in, in faith in Jesus Christ, you are, the Bible says, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. On the, on the day, in the moment that you believed in Christ, the work of God began in your life. And you be, can be confident in this very thing that he who began the good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. And you will stand before the Father bearing the image of the Son. Look, he is like a master potter. He is shaping you and molding you. And he's using circumstances and blessings and adversity and trouble and challenges and confusing times as he is strengthening your faith, forming you and shaping you in those things that you may think are unessential that you may not even understand it is the hand of God in your life as he is making you to bear the image of his son. You are his workmanship. Um, I said this this morning. I want to say it again. You don't have to find your value in the world. You don't have to find your value in the approval of people around you. Why is that the case? Because the Bible says that you are God's work of art, that you are his orchestration, that he is not only pleased with you, but that he has a plan for you and he is doing something great in your life. And the desire that he has now is for you to not walk according to the course of the world, but you should walk according to the course of God. That, that you should live in the good works that God has beforehand prepared for you. And, you know, when the Bible says this, I believe that it speaks of God's before time plan for your life. You know, God lives in the eternal now. He lives in the eternal now. He's not bound by time. God knew you before you were born. God knew the circumstances that you would be dealing with in your life. And God knew the plan that he would have for you, an established plan. And your responsibility now is just to discover the will of God, to be in prayer, to be seeking his face 
to be walking in those things that are pleasing to him. Christian, I just want to encourage you. Do you do that? Do you pray and and ask God what his desires are, what his plan for your life is? Do you really go to prayer when you're confronted with a decision, you're at an intersection in your life and there's a choice to make? Do you spend the time seeking the face of God, asking him, God, what is your before time plan for me in this? What's What's your plan that you've established before the foundation of the world? God, I want to know what you desire so I can walk in the things that are pleasing to you. God has a plan for you. And as you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, the desire that he has is that you would walk according to the course that he has set for you. And let me tell you something. No matter what that course looks like, it is always, it is always the best plan. God's plan is better than your plan could ever be. God's will is better than your will. God's desires are greater than your desires. And, you know, in this process of sanctification, I want to encourage you to make those decisions that are pleasing to God and to live in the eternal plan that he has prepared for you. As you're his workmanship, you're his poema, his orchestration, his masterpiece pulled you out of the rags of sin into the riches of his grace. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your word, God. Just pray tonight that you would bless us as we continue in a time of worship. God, what an amazing portion of scripture to consider. God, to direct us and guide us to a time of gratitude and thanksgiving for all that you've done in our lives. We're humbled, Father, and we acknowledge tonight that it's not us. We have nothing to boast in apart from you. And so we choose tonight to boast in your son, to boast in the cross, to look to the resurrection, to stand in grace. God, we're grateful that you've demonstrated your kindness and your love towards us. And tonight as your sons and daughters, we, we just embrace that gift again the gift of salvation. Tonight, as our eyes are closed and as we're in an attitude of prayer, you know, maybe you've never received the gift of salvation. Maybe for you, it's been a matter of of what you have thought you bring to the table. Maybe for you, you know, you were a lot like me. You've kind of lived in a a, a resistance against God and, and even being around Christians is uncomfortable for you because it reminds you that you are far from God. Tonight there's a gift. Wherever you find yourself tonight in either of these situations or something else, there's a gift tonight for you to receive, a gift of salvation. God did it for you. God has always loved you and he's reaching out to you and he's he's extending his love for you to take and to receive, to make your own a love that will lead to to salvation, the saving of your soul, everlasting life. He will raise you up into the heavenly places. He will seat you with his son. He will pour out gifts into your life and blessings that you could never even imagine. He will change the desires of your heart and he will set you on a new course. Tonight, if you've never taken the step of faith and and received Christ as your Savior. This evening, right where you're sitting, I want to pray for you. I'm just going to ask you tonight, would you raise your hand if this is you and you want to take that step of faith and you want to trust in Jesus Christ tonight. You want to look to him for salvation, for the forgiveness of your sins. You want to receive the gift of God. Stretch your hand up tonight. God bless you. Thank you so much here in the front on my left. Anybody else? Over in the back of my right, thank you for raising your hand. Here on my left, thank you for raising your hand. Maybe as a Christian tonight, you know you need some renewal. Maybe maybe the truth is you've become like an old wineskin. Maybe not to the point of being petrified, but you know. You know your heart is hardened. 
and maybe, you know, you've been leaning on yourself and looking to your works instead of God's, and you just need a fresh work of God's Spirit. You need to be dipped in the oil of the Spirit of God. You need spiritual renewal. He's present tonight to give that to you. If this is you, raise your hand tonight. I want to pray for you. Thank you so much. I see your hand in yours, in yours, in yours. God bless you. And over here on my right, thank you. I see your hand over here. Thank you so much. It takes a lot of courage. You know, God's going to hear your heart. He's going to answer you tonight. He loves you. Father, thank you. God, thank you so much for these precious souls that, that you love, God, that, that are yours. We pray tonight that you would strengthen them as they look to Jesus, your son, in faith. Tonight, right where you're sitting, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer, a prayer of turning from sin, the course of this world, and turning your heart to God, looking to the gospel, looking to the Son of God. It's the heart of God for you to receive the gifts that he has. And so this is simply what you're doing by faith tonight as you pray. Follow me in prayer tonight if this is you. God, tonight, I confess I've sinned against you. God, I'm turning from my sin. Tonight, I believe in Jesus Christ, your son. His death for me, his resurrection. And tonight, by faith, I receive your grace. I receive your salvation. I receive spiritual renewal. I receive strength. I receive your hope. Tonight, I receive you. God, fill my life with your love and help me to walk with you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you followed in prayer tonight, praise God for the step of faith that you've taken this evening.